When we read in Revelation about what heaven is like, we get little tastes of heaven here on earth on Sunday mornings, I think, when we're all praising the Lord together. Uh, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 1, this is on page 976 if you're using your pew Bibles this morning. Paul writes this as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We have been exulting in your salvation, the, the grace that you bestowed upon us, your mercies. And here in your word, we hear that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Lord, as we focus in on what your word tells us this morning through your servant, Paul, we ask that you'd help us to have hearts brimming with joy, brimming with praise, that along with Paul, we could be those who say, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and say it from the heart. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, maybe some of you have had a great week. Maybe even some of you had the best week of your life this past week. That's possible. Has anyone had the best week in their life this past week? Yes, good. I, I was hoping someone had. So after church this morning, everyone should go and congratulate Bill for <laughs> experiencing the best week of his life. Good. If you've had that kind of week, it's not hard to be thankful to God. It's not hard to praise God for what he's done. But what if your week was just uh, blah? Or even worse, what if your week was one of the worst weeks of your life? Remember last week when we began our study of the book of Ephesians, we saw that one thing that Paul brought out about himself was that he was a prisoner. He was under house arrest, uh, awaiting trial before Caesar. And Caesar at the time was Nero. Uh, he might live through such a trial. Nero was, as we know now, I don't know if Paul knew this, but we know now he is more or less crazy. He might live, he might die. Uh, but whatever the case is, he's writing this, he's under house arrest, and Paul was a minister of the gospel. He is hungry to be out there sharing Christ with people, and here he is under house arrest. At first thought, you might think that his ministry had been shut down. How are you going to bless God if you've just had that kind of week? What are you going to thank God for when you've had that kind of week? If you're a Christian, if you've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, then this morning, Paul gives you an example of reasons to praise God, bless God, even when your week has been blah, or even when it has been terrible. Three reasons he praises God no matter what, even from a Roman jail cell. And here in verse 3, that's what we'll be looking at this morning. Paul gives us three reasons he blesses God, he praises God in the midst of his imprisonment. And I take it he does so, so that we might join together with him in praising our great God. If you're truly a believer in Jesus Christ and here this morning, I can say that no matter what else might be going on in your life, no matter what circumstances you might be facing, you can praise God like Paul did here. You can bless God like this because what Paul is blessing God for, he, he doesn't say God has blessed me, but God has blessed us. So this is something that's true for each one of us who are believers in Jesus Christ here this morning. Now before getting into these three reasons that we can see from Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 that Paul blesses God, uh, let's focus on what Paul says first about our great God and give a little intro to this whole section, beginning with verse 3 and extending all the way down through verse 14. 
Uh, first, taking the first word of verse 3, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Look down there in your Bibles. Blessed. Blessed. As we focus on God, we're first going to be thinking on his praise. The way Paul begins here in verse 3 is really unusual for him in his letters. Usually he starts with thanking God for his work in the believers' lives and for uh, prayers for them for what he'd like to see God do in their lives. He'll get to that, and that'll begin in verse 15, but he has this long extended section at the start here that normally he doesn't have in his letters. Before he can get to what he usually does in his letters, thanking God for believers specifically, praying for them that God would work in their hearts and in their lives, and usually he's praying that they would grow in their love for God and for others. Uh, before he gets to that, it's as if he can't contain himself as he contemplates God and what he's done for us. He bursts forth here this morning in a, uh, it can be termed a hymn of praise. What we're going to see here is that his knowledge of God and God's blessings impacted his life in a major way. He, uh, Paul's theology, in other words, what he knows about God led to doxology. His theology led to doxology. And that's my prayer for us as a body of believers as we begin going through verse 3 and then down through verse 14 in this section. That as we see Paul praise God for all that he's done for us and, and the amazing grace that he's poured out upon us that our hearts would well up. And we'd be hardly able to contain ourselves from saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you probably are aware of this, but just in case you're not, one of the main reasons, I would say the main reason that we are even biblically a church is that we are proclaiming God's excellencies. We are exalting in him. So, so this portion of God's word really helps us in doing that. Uh, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, as he identifies us not just as individuals, but as part of a larger whole, he doesn't use the word church here, but this is us as a bigger group, not just me as an individual. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So we can say this, this is a, a church thing. That, this is the purpose, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that's, that's just what we want to accomplish here. God be proclaimed. God be praised for what he's done. So where do we get this idea that uh, Paul is praising God or his praise? It's right at the start of verse 3. He begins with, as we already saw, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is from the Greek word eulagetas. And you don't need to try writing that down. But our word eulogy comes from that basic Greek word family. So when you hear eulogy, the eulogy is what? It's that part of the funeral service or memorial service where uh, people speak well of someone who's passed on to go to be with the Lord. Eulagetas is the Greek word. You, good, lagas, words. It's good words. Uh, it's a different word than what we'll see here uh, a little further in this section. Uh, Paul will speak of, it's to the praise of his glorious grace. That's a slightly different Greek word. But one scholar notes that what begins here and goes down through verse 13 is an example of what's called descriptive or declarative, excuse me, praise. It's declarative in that it is a response to definite actions of God on behalf of his people. So here Paul is declaring God blessed, blessed. And then he goes on to declare what God has done for us, why he's calling him blessed. Maybe you've heard this before. I think many of you have probably studied the <clears throat> book of Ephesians before in your lives. But Paul is so caught up in praise to God that he continues to pour out word upon word upon word without pausing to complete this sentence until verse 14. Uh, sometimes I have run on sentences. But this is, this is a long 
sentence, all one sentence, verse 3 down through verse 14 in the original languages is one long sentence of over 200 words. Uh, I know you won't be able to see this very well, but I just want you to see a leady diagram of this portion of Scripture, verse 3 down through verse 14, to get an idea of how complex this is. I don't know if you remember from your grammar school days of trying to diagram uh, English. This is all in Greek, so you can say it's all Greek to me. But you can't see the words. You can't see the words here anyhow. But here, here's the start. Here's where we're at, and then it just goes on and on and on and on down to there. That's a diagram. Try to try to diagram that in English class. That's one sentence in the original languages. In the midst of that very complex sentence, there are three key phrases, three main thoughts that keep repeating themselves. First is the sovereign will of God. We see him use the phrase God's will or, or something like that in verse 5, verse 9, verse 11 here in chapter 1. Uh, he speaks of God acting according. He, he's doing things. He does what he does according to his will. Second, we see uh, the praise of his glory. That is repeated also at key points throughout this section. Verses 6, 12, and 14. And with this, Paul reminds us in these key points, he reminds us the, of the truth that God acts that God blesses us as he does. Ultimately, it's great for us, but ultimately he's doing it to the praise of his glory. And third, uh, we see the key identity in Christ. Verses 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. We see in Christ, in him, in whom. He just keeps repeating that over and over through this section this morning we'll identify a little bit more, we'll describe a little bit more what that term means in this context, in Christ. But uh, I think for you, if you haven't done so before, if you're one who writes in your Bible, it'd be good to even underline all the times that Paul says in Christ or in him or in whom throughout this section. Because his point is that the blessings that we see here are for us only as we are identified with Jesus Christ. That's, that's key. That's what we'll be looking at this morning as well. Uh, Donald McDougall brings these ideas together in a summary of these verses. He writes this, using the words in this passage, these verses can be summarized in the statement that God is doing all things after the counsel of his will in and through the person of Christ for the praise of his glory. So it starts out here, blessed be the God, and in declaring what he's done for us, Paul keeps emphasizing it's ultimately for the praise of his glory. So we've seen his praise, now let's focus on his person. His person. In other words, how does Paul describe this God, this one whom deserves all praise and glory and honor? Verse 3 again. Uh, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Interestingly, and maybe not surprising with how often Paul keeps saying in Christ, in Christ, in whom, in him, throughout this section. But Jesus Christ is so in the forefront of Paul's thoughts and it was in and through Jesus Christ that he experienced and we experienced any of the blessings that we're going to be talking about here this morning. That when uh, Paul identifies this blessed one, the one who's to receive the glory and honor and praise, he immediately connects him with Jesus Christ. It's kind of like when my daughter Ella was a little bit younger, maybe still right now. Her friends, the neighbors on our block would not really identify me as Scott or Mr. Hecht, but as Ella's dad. Here, as Paul identifies the blessed one, as he describes his person, who he, who he is, he speaks of him as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So everything, everything's kind of focusing around Christ here. Now roll that phrase around in your thoughts a little bit this morning. Maybe as you think about this, you you're, don't notice anything that 
possibly unusual. Uh, maybe you might notice something. Maybe you think, well, I can see how God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a phrase I often see in the New Testament. But in what sense can God be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's what he says here. Uh, look down to verse 17 here in chapter 1. He says about the same thing. I, I guess we could say even more bluntly, uh, chapter 1, verse 17 he says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. So does that mean that uh, Paul would agree with Muslim teachers who would say that Jesus is a great man, but he's, he's that. He, he's a prophet, but, but he's just that. Or maybe even Jehovah Witnesses who would say something like, well, he's more than a great man. He's some kind of divine being, but he's not fully God. Is that what Paul is getting at when he says this? Absolutely not. He's not saying that. Uh, right in the context here, we note two things to, to be clear, that Paul is not diminishing somehow Jesus' deity. Uh, verse 2, we just read this uh, this morning and looked at it last week, but look at verse 2 again, Ephesians 1 verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul brings out here, as he does elsewhere, that the source of grace and peace is equally God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as, why, why I bring that out is, as far as I know, nowhere else in all Scripture is any man ever equated with God as the source of blessings, like Jesus is here. Here, God the Father and God the Son, Jesus Christ, are treated as equals. Jesus isn't some kind of lesser being or just a man. He's fully God. Second, note in verse 2 and 3, here in chapter 1, the title that Jesus is given. Verse 2, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's very common for us to think of Jesus Christ as Lord. It's very common to call him the Lord. And maybe it's so common we don't even think about what we're saying when we call him that. It has uh, ramifications, implications. But at least one thing that would be involved with calling Jesus Christ Lord, uh, it's from the Greek root word kyrios. Uh, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, when the Hebrew word Yahweh was translated, it would be translated as Kyrios, 6,814 times in the Old Testament. So Yahweh was God's holy name that was given in the Old Testament. Uh, so holy, some Jews of the time wouldn't even say it. And that was translated as Kyrios. So, theologian Wayne Grudem writes that when Jesus was called Lord as his title, the Lord Jesus Christ, any Greek-speaking reader would have recognized that in context where it was appropriate. The word Lord was the name of the one who was the creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, the omnipotent God. So here Paul is saying, this is his title. This is Jesus' title, Lord. He's fully God. Uh, we, we've just finished our very extensive series on the Gospel of John, and we see in the Gospel of John over and over and over that Jesus is all that God is. So as Scripture interprets Scripture, we know that Jesus isn't just some lesser being or something like that, or merely a teacher or merely a prophet. He's fully God. Now, that doesn't answer the question, though. How does Paul here speak of Jesus, then, and call God the Father as the God of our Lord Jesus Christ? What might seem like a difficult question is simplified when we remember that Jesus is not only fully God, but he's also fully man. And Scripture brings out that although God the Son has eternally existed in his incarnation, when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, when he was born of the Virgin Mary, he also became fully man without ceasing to be God. 
So Jesus is one person with two natures, a divine nature, fully God, a human nature, fully man. Here's, we're getting to the part of the explanation. Jesus, according to his human nature, could learn things. He could grow. Uh, Luke 2 verse 52 says this, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Just as according to his human nature, he could learn and grow. So also according to his human nature, God was his God. Uh, turn back to the Gospel of John. We see both his complete humanity as well as his full deity brought out in the same chapter, on the same uh, resurrection chapter here, John chapter 20. Begin with verse 17. This is Jesus on the day of his resurrection from the dead. He's talking with Mary Magdalene. John 20, verse 17. Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to what? My God and your God. So Jesus himself would speak sometimes, speak of God as my God. So what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and in verse 17, it fits with what Jesus himself said, but that doesn't contradict the fact that he also has a divine nature. He's fully God. Look later in the same chapter here, down to verse 27. This is eight days later. When he appeared to Thomas, then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't correct him. He doesn't say, okay, Thomas, you're a little overwhelmed here. You're just seeing me after I've been raised from the dead, but don't get too out of line. No, he commends what Thomas has said here. Look at verse 29, the next verse. Jesus said to him, have you believed? So this is an expression of belief. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Here Jesus states that Thomas' affirmation that Jesus was my Lord and my God that's part of the very heart of what we believe about Jesus Christ. So, again, there's no contradiction in Jesus saying, my God, uh, when he's talking to uh, Mary Magdalene, and himself being fully God. Because Jesus is both fully man, and as a man, he can speak of God as my God, and he's fully God. So he can receive someone talking to him as my Lord and my God. That's all, that's all true. The revelation we have in the Bible compels us to affirm Jesus' full humanity and his full deity. Uh, we see Paul doing that in Ephesians 1 verse 3 when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Bible scholar R.C.H. Lenski puts it this way. Maybe, maybe not. I guess not. No, I didn't get it in there. Sorry about that. I'll just read it for you. He says, for Jesus in his human nature, God is his God. And for Jesus in his deity, God is his Father. His God since the incarnation. His Father from all eternity. Above all else, if you don't remember anything else from this message this morning, uh, the one we praise, the one we glorify is not just God as we imagine him to be or God as we want him to be. It's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unless it's him that we're praising, our praise is simply noise. Now, let's turn attention from the blessed one to the blessings. Look down at verse 3 again. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be, you lagetas. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed eulagesas, us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, eulagia, 
in the heavenly places. I see a little pattern here. I hope you do after I tried to say these awful Greek words. Uh, he, he keeps building off the same idea throughout this section, how we, uh, what we're called to do or what he's saying of God. The similar word is now used in what God has done to us, how he's blessed us. And John MacArthur, I think, really brings out well how these all fit together. He says this, when we bless God, we speak well of him. Eulageus. When he blesses us, he communicates good to us. We bless him with words. He blesses us with deeds. All we can do is speak well of him. Because in ourselves we have nothing good to give. And in himself he lacks no goodness. But when he blesses us, the situation is reversed. He cannot bless us for our goodness because we have none. Rather, he blesses us with goodness. Our Heavenly Father lavishes us with every goodness, every gift, every blessing. That is his nature and that is our need. So in the remainder of our time this morning, we're going to focus on three reasons that Paul blesses God in the midst of his imprisonment. Again, so we would join together with him in praising, blessing God like this, speaking well of God. First, Paul blesses God because of the fact of our blessings. Now, what's this mean? I'm just trying, maybe not the best, but I'm trying to describe Paul's language that he uses here in verse 3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. In other words, this, this isn't something that we hope for. It's not something that we strive for. It's a completed action. It's a fact. He has blessed us. There's uh, some Christians who speak about a, a second blessing after you get saved. There's certain things you need to do to receive the second blessing. I take it that whole teaching should be rejected because of Paul's words here. There, there's no second blessing that we yet wait for. Paul rejoices in God. Paul blesses God here because this is already done. He has blessed us. And this is no small blessing. It's with every spiritual blessing. We'll spend more time on that in a moment. For now, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, where we see the same idea brought out by Peter. Page 1018, if you're using the Pew Bibles this morning. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then verse 3. He tells why that prayer wish can happen. Seeing that, or as... His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Since God has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Since this is true, Peter's saying, I have a firm basis in, in then saying, giving this prayer wish, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Since that, there's that provision that's already been made, I'm on firm footing when I say, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Uh, if I'm a car salesman and I know that you have a, a billion dollars in the bank, uh, I, I don't feel it's too bad to, to try to deal with you and, and have you to buy this $40,000 car. I know you can afford it. I know you can do it. Uh, so Paul, or Peter here, is, he, he, he writes in light of, you've been granted this, so I, I have this wish this prayer may grace and peace be multiplied to you look down to verse 3 again this is why i wanted to come here his divine power has granted us stop there again has granted us it's been done you didn't think you're going to get greek lessons this morning with eulagetas and participles and sentence diagrams but here's one more thing for you this is what's known as a perfect passive participle what this means is that it's happened in the past with ongoing results. Just like Paul said in Ephesians 1 verse 3, we've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. It's a fact. It's happened. These things have been granted to you. 
Uh, why, why this is significant is sometimes false teachers in New Testament times, and I think today as well, will come and approach believers and say, you know, uh, you're kind of an average Christian, but I have some secret knowledge that will really elevate your spiritual life. Uh, in our, I don't think they'd say this in Paul's day, but in our day they might say something like, I, I have a book that brings things together that have never been put together before. I have this program that will elevate you, that will make you higher and more spiritual than anything else ever with this program, with this book. I have the secret. Here's why this grammatical point is important. You have every spiritual blessing. This has been granted to you. You don't need a secret. You don't need some teacher to come in and say, now here's how you really get more of God or really get more of the Holy Spirit. Uh, no, we, we've been blessed with this. We've been granted these things. Paul brings out the same thing in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He says this, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled. Not you will, not you might be. You have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You don't need the something more that the false teachers offer. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. You've been filled. His divine power has granted you all that's necessary for life and godliness. Turn back to Ephesians 1 verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Page 976 in the Pew Bibles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ. There's that term. This is the second reason Paul blesses God. He praises God here. Because of the reason for our blessings. And the reason is just that little two-word phrase, in Christ. In him. In whom. Obviously, this is a key concept since Paul repeats it over and over almost every verse in this section from here down to verse 14. Here, it's used in the sense when, when Paul says in Christ, it, it has the meaning, it has the sense of in union with Christ as a representative. It, it's basically God's decision as our gracious judge to see us not as we are in ourselves, not what we're like just as, as Scott Hecht, but in relation to, in union with Christ as a representative. Uh, Jerry Bridges uh, brings out the idea of our union with Christ being in Christ. He says this, God sees us legally as so connected with Christ that what he did, we did. When he lived a life of perfect obedience, it's as if we had lived a life of perfect obedience. When he died on the cross to satisfy the just demands of God's law, it's as if we had died on that cross. Christ stood in our place as our representative, both in his sinless life and his sin-bearing death. And what Paul brings out here in Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 3, everything that we've been blessed with, all these things that we're going to talk about in, the moment, in a moment, every spiritual blessing, it's all because of the fact that we are identified with Jesus Christ. It's because we are in union with Christ as a representative. These blessings we exult in, that we praise God for, they're all because God graciously determined to look at us, not as we are in ourselves, but as we are in connection with Jesus Christ, we are in him. Third and finally this morning, Paul blesses God because of the content of our spiritual blessings or the content of our blessings. Middle of verse three, who has blessed us in Christ with, what's he say? Just see if anyone's still awake at this point. Thank you. There's some people awake. Good. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So what's a spiritual blessing? Uh, spiritual blessings are blessings that are bound up with the Holy Spirit. In other words, what makes these blessings spiritual blessings is the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Any way that the Holy Spirit might work in our lives is what makes these blessings spiritual blessings. 
So Paul says, we have them. We've been blessed with them. We have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It's kind of a crass illustration I'm going to give, but I think it works. I think it fits. It helps us to understand what's going on here. Consider every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places like having a billion dollars in the bank. If you don't know that you have a billion dollars, does it do you any good? No. Uh, if you do know you have it, but you won't use a debit card or a check or something to use it, will it do you any good? No. You need to appropriate what you have. I take it the same holds true for every spiritual blessing, all the things that God has granted us. Uh, it's there, we have it, it's yours, it's mine, but we need to appropriate what we have. Uh, Christian author Jerry Bridges, again, he, he writes helpfully in this area. And note when he's going to speak in this quote I'm going to read of God's grace, he uses it in the sense sometimes we see elsewhere in the New Testament a grace as God's divine favor to us through the Holy Spirit, his assistance to us through the Holy Spirit. So Bridges writes this, Perhaps the idea of appropriating the grace of God is a new thought to you, and you're not quite sure what I mean. The basic meaning of the word is to take possession of, and that's what we do when we appropriate God's grace. We take possession of the divine strength he has made available to us in Christ. To use an analogy, we draw on an in inexhaustible bank account, the account of God's grace. Now, there are times when the Holy Spirit works in a sovereign way in our lives apart from any appropriating activity on our part. But more often, he expects us to act to appropriate his grace. And, and what we see in the rest of Ephesians and the rest of the New Testament is there are at least five avenues or five streams that we can place ourselves in to appropriate this grace or these blessings that we have or his divine power and they are spirit-produced desires, Galatians chapter 5, difficult circumstances, 2 Corinthians 13, prayer, the word of God, benefiting from other believers' spiritual gifts. Uh, we don't have time to go deep in this this morning, but just turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Here we see, I take it, Paul appropriating what he's saying here in Ephesians chapter 1, You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. So now he's seeking to appropriate it in the lives of the believers. Ephesians 3, verse 14. Turn over there in your Bibles. He says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that, according to the riches of his glory, here, here's these riches that we've already been blessed with. We have in our spiritual bank account, so to speak. Uh, every spiritual blessing. According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So he's praying for them that this would become uh, real, that it become active, that they'd appropriate these blessings in their lives, these spiritual blessings. So now as believers, we, we live in light of that. We, we seek to appropriate in our daily lives as believers through prayer, through the powerful word of God, through faith in God's promises, uh, these blessings that we have already been blessed with. Turn back to Ephesians 1 verse 3. He says at the end of the verse, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So what's that? Paul here uses a slightly different word than he normally does for heaven. He uses it five times in Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 3, 20, chapter 2, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 12. I want you to turn back to chapter 6, verse 12, why this is a little different word than you might think. Just maybe a little broader term than heaven. Ephesians 6, verse 12. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavenly places. Same term. I take it the heavenly places that he speaks of throughout Ephesians include what we commonly think of as heaven, but it, it's a broader term. I, I take it as the spiritual realm as a whole. Uh, Bible scholar J. Armitage Robinson puts it this way. He says, uh, the heavenly sphere then is the sphere of spiritual activities, that immaterial region, that unseen universe which lies behind the world of sense. It's in this realm. It's in this realm that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. It's in this realm that we have all the spiritual resources needed to battle with the forces of evil and darkness and satanic forces and demonic forces that are in that realm. Uh, it's in that realm that we are seated with Christ, who Paul tells us in verse 20 of Ephesians 1 is seated far above all rule and authority and above dominion. Every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So with his strength, with his armor, we can stand against whatever evil forces might throw against us. Can we join with Paul this morning in blessing God? Amen. Yes, yes, good. Yeah, good, good. We can do it because of the fact of our blessings because of the reason for our blessings, because of the content of our blessings, we have every spiritual blessing. Nothing is left out. Every spiritual resource that we could want to live for Jesus in this world. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you and bless you. We speak well of you for what you've done for us. You've blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Lord, as I've tried to proclaim it and bring out what these things even are, I, I ask that you, through your Spirit, would uh, warm our hearts with these things, help us to understand these things. Later, we'll see the Apostle Paul praying for uh, believers that they would have strength to comprehend this love that we've been loved with and just know what we've been blessed with. So I pray for us as your children here this morning. Uh, Many are going through very hard times, very difficult times, and maybe not a whole lot, humanly speaking, to praise you for. Lord, as we think of these blessings that we have, the fact that we are identified with Christ, the fact that these are things that have already been done, we don't need to strive for it. We've been blessed already this way. Please, through your Spirit, warm our hearts, help us to be a people of praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.